back. I'm Jeffrey Brown, and I'm joined now by the novelist Siri Hustved. We're talking about her new novel, The Blazing World. Welcome. Thank you. There, there is a lot of art history in this book. There's a lot of um, gender politics. There's a lot more, but I assume that as a writer, first there's a story you wanted to, to tell. Yes. Uh, I was actually thinking about the idea of pseudonyms uh, in general, mm -hmm. and also what it means to put on a mask and wear a mask, as in Greek theater, which mm -hmm. was very important to the genesis of the story. Did you mean literally take on a different identity? Yes, a different identity, and how that mask affects one's idea of a self mm -hmm. and changes it in some way. So the fairy tale of the book is very simple. A woman artist decides to make an experiment mm -hmm. by using three living men as her masks or fronts to show work that she's made for her. That's the simple, you know, three-part fairy tale of the book. And it is set in a very specific time and place. It in is. In the art world, in New York, in, in the New 1980s. York City. When a lot of these issues were very much front and center. I think they, they still are you do. front and center. Yeah. And if you actually, some of these numbers are quoted in the book. If you look at the number of solo shows in New York mm -hmm. City that are by women, it hovers around 20%. Mm -hmm. um, that's not nearly close to 50%. Mm -hmm. And the fact that actually there are more women in art schools than men makes one wonder what this is all about. Mm -hmm. But that particular that time, as I recall, because I was there at the time too, was when a lot of this was really getting spoken out. Well, the Gorilla Girls appeared yeah. on the scene exactly mm -hmm. in 1986. Mm -hmm. um, this story takes place a bit later. Um, it the conceit of the novel is that the central character, the artist, is dead, and an editor has compiled texts about this woman because after her death, posthumously, uh, her work has become very interesting to many people. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole thing. And yes, there are multiple references, even footnotes by this mysterious editor that has no sex. We don't know whether it's a man or a woman. We, but it is written in, you use many voices. There are right? 20 I hope distinct voices in the book. <laughs> and uh, why did you do that? Why, uh, why did you try to have that, uh, that that many voices? Well, because the form of the book echoes the theme of the book, which is really about perception. Mm -hmm. How do we see? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of uh, scientific evidence that we see generally what we expect to see. In other mm -hmm. words, we see through past patterns of of experience that then shape our present perception. So we fill in what is missing mm -hmm. through the past. And this may explain some reasons why perceptions are often hugely biased. Yeah. So each of my speakers uh, has a very different perspective from every other. And this makes it important, I think, for the reader to understand that there's no unified truth with a capital T in the book. And the reader is forced back on him or herself mm -hmm. to make decisions about where the truth lies or if there is any truth, um, how to find one's way through the puzzle, the maze, and all the ironies of well, the novel. Well, uh, of course, it also goes to this question of what one is seeing, right? If the expectation yes. is this is by a man, for example, yes. do we see it yes. one way? If, as opposed to knowing it was by. I think so. I think that, you know, uh, the idea of female genius still remains something of an oxymoron. We like our genius as male. Mm. And uh, this character, my character, Harriet Burden, the artist, is, I think, a female genius. Mm -hmm. And that makes her something of a monster. <laughs> <laughs> you say that as though you enjoy it. I did. I enjoyed writing this book. I enjoyed being all the different characters. I felt at times as if I had multiple personality disorder. Yeah. Well, but yeah. was it hard to have so many voices, uh, distinct voices? Well, I, I, it was because when I made transitions from one voice to the other, I had to recover uh, an earlier voice. And that was a very strange experience. Many writers, of course, have written in, in multiple voices, but I had never done it before. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was uh, 
an exhilarating experience. Mm -hmm. you, you, I know you write a lot about art as well as your novels. Are, are those different parts of your brain being used or different parts of your personality? How, how do you see them? Yes, I, I have actually another life, um, writing about art, but also writing about philosophy, neuroscience, psychiatry, and interdisciplinary subjects. So I do a lot of lecturing at conferences on these subjects. Mm -hmm. And the difference, I can say, is this, that for a lecture or a paper, one has to make an argument. So there's a kind of teleology or movement that's different from writing a novel. The great pleasure in writing a novel, I think, is that it tolerates everything. No argument as such has to be made. It needs a shape. Mm -hmm. But you can have multiple ideas inside uh, a novel that do not have to be resolved in the same way. I so, see. yeah, mm. it's a great forum yeah. for ideas, yeah. the novel. You certainly don't have to excuse or explain any particular thing when it's in the novel because it can all belong. It can, and it yeah. can belong to the voice of a particular yeah. character who has a particular perspective. Yeah. What about for you, though, the, 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 the person behind these different worlds? I mean, are they connected in your... I yes. know you have to you probably have to separate them as you're doing them. Or do you, actually? Yes, yeah. well, I probably separate them less and less. I mean, yeah. this novel is full of, of references to yeah. uh, what I've read, to what I know, and I've given all those references to my character, Harriet Burden. So in some sense, these wor worlds collide. Mm -hmm. I, I've read that you... Um, imagined yourself or even began writing as a young girl? Yes, I decided to become a writer when I was 13 and that was the result of reading many, many, many great novels. Yeah, uh, you decided. I decided, yes. I was in Reykjavik, Iceland. I remember exactly where I was. <laughs> and I thought, if books can do this, then that's what I want to do. Really? Yeah. OK, so what was the, mo <laughs> what was the moment? Well, it was. I was up in, I was in Reykjavik. It was summer, so it was light all night. And for mm -hmm. the first time in my life, I had insomnia. Yeah. And I had been reading David Copperfield with great passion. Of course, the story of a child. I was yeah. still a child in many ways. Yeah. I put the book down. And I went to look out the window, and Reykjavik was still light. And I was filled with, you know, this almost transcendent feeling of the strangeness of the city. And I said to myself, I know now. That's what I want to do. Of course, yeah. people thought it was a complete twit yeah. announcing these great ambitions. Right, I bet, right. Here <laughs> but I am. Anyway, you pronounced yourself to the world. I did, yes, a, a I did. I told everyone. To, right? Yes, yeah. yes, how silly. But nevertheless, uh, sometimes those uh, silly ideas become fixed ideas. Right, but once, they, once it's an idea, you have to make it happen. There was, was, when was the moment where you realized I, I I, yeah. it's happened? Yes, I started writing yeah. uh, instantly, yeah. actually. Yeah. So I was always writing stories and poems and continued to do so until I f published my first poem in the Paris Review when I was 23. Huh. So just in our last minute or two, just come back to the theme of, of, of the book here. And we're actually, you started earlier talking about how you think a lot of these things, um, the, gen the sexism s continues to exist in, in the art world, is it in the literary world as well? I think it kind of exists generally, yes. Generally, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that there are still very old and often unconscious ideas about masculinity and femininity. For example, that masculinity is associated with the mind you know, intellect yeah. and culture, yeah. and femininity is associated, you know, with the body yeah. and nature yeah. and emotion. Yeah. So those associations are powerful in all of us, not just men, by the way, but men and women alike. Yeah. Yeah. And we carry them with us, yeah. and they're potent. Yeah, but, but we have grown up in a time, and no doubt see uh, in our own children, and, and we must have students, perhaps. I mean, in the art school, there's more women. In the writing programs, there's more women. Yes. But, you, but yes. that has, has that not changed enough? It has changed, but it hasn't changed enough. And I think it's interesting. This is a question that Simone de Beauvoir addressed a long time ago in The Second Sex, 1949. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, when was the last time you ever heard anyone refer to a man writer? 
a man artist, uh -huh. a man composer. Yeah. But we re routinely talk about women artists, women writers, yeah. women composers, because women still do, con do not constitute a universal. Still. Huh. Huh? And we should, because we're half the human race. All right, Siri, who's <laughs> today? Writer. <laughs> writer. <laughs> writer, a novelist, uh, her new novel is The Blazing World. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.